to include um, a little note that explains what, what went wrong. But I would like to take a minute to talk about it both for folks here and folks out in TV land. So let me download um, the corrected example off of Canvas and then we can take a look at it. The code that I had was correct. The problem was is I didn't save the file correctly. And I'll show you specifically what I mean in a second. All right, so I extracted all the files into a Monday folder on the desktop. And whenever you create a file in Notepad, if you remember, when you go to save it, you have to change from text file to all files, and then you can pick um, the extension that you want to save it as. Let me go out and turn file extensions on again. Okay. So, if you go and save this, let's pretend we're saving it for the first time. Notice how, for this file, the encoding was set to Unicode. All right. That relates to the character set being used. All right. Um, this comes into play when you use um, international character sets, character sets that aren't the standard English, American, A through Z, but there's additional letters or additional symbols and so on. So what I did is I saved the HTML as Unicode, but when I created the style sheet, and went to save it, Well, right now is UTF-8, but I had it set as ANSI. And if you do that, then okay, it worked. But I had a conflict between those two things. It's the oh, it worked in Internet Explorer. That's right. It worked in Internet Explorer last time. It didn't work in Chrome. That's right. It didn't work in Chrome. But if I go in and I make sure this is saved the same way, so if I'd save both of them as Unicode, then when I open up in Google Chrome, it works. Okay, so the bottom line is, Make sure that you have a consistency between the encoding of the HTML file and the CSS file. All right. Um, we can look up more about Unicode. I'm sure someone online can do a more comprehensive. Unicode is a computing industry standard for the consistent encoding, representation, and handling of text expressed in most of the world's writing systems. 
So again, standard and C, which I believe the style sheet was originally stored in, is an American National Standards Institute. So it's typically for the characters that you'd find in American English. Whereas Unicode, if you notice, there's charts that show in all these different scripts all the special characters and the, and the encoding for them. All right? So that, the bottom line is that's what the problem was, is that when I went to save it, I did not save it in the same format um, or with the same encoding as I did the HTML file. That is, when I went to save the external style sheet, I didn't save it in the same format or with the same encoding as the web page, and therefore Chrome didn't like it. All right, and Chrome complained, and Chrome complained by simply disregarding the style sheet. Um, it was funny because I went upstairs and did a little bit of research on this in lab, and as soon as I saw that issue, it was like, ah, that's what I did. All right, so actually it didn't take me long to debug this. It didn't take me as long as I thought it was. I had thought that there was maybe some kind of browser setting that was goofy or something. But when I went upstairs and had the same problem, it's like, okay, it's probably not the browser setting then, it's probably something I did. See, you always try to blame it on something else, right? But usually it ends up being something you did. Yes? Yes? Uh huh. Right. Right, 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 right. And then at the end of the day, they're like, okay, it's up, we changed it. Yeah. They, they screwed up with something. Yeah. Something in Mozilla for, for. Right, yeah. It, yeah, it's funny. It's usually like, um, you know, and, and the other thing that you always hear software developers say is it works, works fine on my machine, you know. But when I put it out on the web, it doesn't work. Well, okay, so. Keep your house open 24 hours a day so anyone who wants to visit your website can go in and use your machine to access it. No, that's not the right answer. You know. uh, and again, a lot of times, you know, sometimes it, there is things outside of your control that are causing the problems. But um, <laughs> you better be darn sure of that <laughs> before, uh, before you start saying, no, it's nothing I did. All right. Um, I just have one question. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, again, that 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 could be another another way of identifying um that. Someone else? Yes. The, the best encoding to use? Well, that's a good question. Um, UTF-8, uh, if you're talking standard American characters, and well, let's look up UTF-8 and see, get a precise definition on that. UTF-8 is sort of a slightly different version of Unicode. So UTF-8 probably would be um, the, uh, the, the one to use. Notice that here's a chart that shows over time, all right, um, UTF-8 has been going up. ASCII, also known as ANSI, um, has been going down. And this other one, ISO 85, I'm not, I'm not sure what that is. All right. That being said, UTF-8 UTF is probably the best way to go with that. Um, 
it would be easier for you to make um, it would be easier for you to make internationalized versions of your page. Now, if you knew, for example, and again, here's a UTF character table. Oh, this is just between German and English. Um, it shows the encoding for that. And notice again, there's some special characters like here for letters that are accented and so on. Um, The one thing I would say is, is I, I do have to confess to be um, not as well versed about this as I probably should be. W3Schools has a Unicode um, page where it talks about different encodings. HTML for support uh, that. And there's ways uh, that you can uh, some of the character sets that are included. I believe by looking at this, it, it almost looks to me that um, the, the UTF-8 um, and probably UTF-16 would be based more on like the European model for languages. I think to use like some of the Asian languages or Middle Eastern languages, I think you would use Unicode for that. Uh, but I, again, I, I have to confess I'm not um, terribly familiar with that, uh, as I should. You know, I should be more familiar with that than I am. And that's one thing to keep in mind as you're developing pages, that unless you know your scope is very narrow, you, know, you don't know who's on the other end of the browser. And uh, you might want to accommodate, you know, your page might want to accommodate um, a, a wider range of character sets. If you're talking about just doing things, you know, and using standard English, standard American character set, then UTF-8 is probably the way to go. All right, other questions. Let's review that since, let, let's review the, the external style sheet since um, I spent a fair amount of time last time wrestling with the problem and kind of lost focus on what I was actually trying to teach. All right, the idea for the external style sheet is like this. I'm going to take the style code and put it somewhere else in a separate file. And every one of my HTML pages is going to refer to that separate file. So, I put the style code in a file by itself. Notice there are no style tags in here. You do not have to identify the style tags because we're going to tell the browser in a different manner that this is CSS code. Okay, so we simply have the CSS code. What does the CSS code consist of? It consists of a series of rules. All right, each rule consists of a selector, which is this part, all right, and then a series of attributes and values. The attribute is the characteristic that you want to change. There's a colon, then you have the value, and then you have a semicolon. Okay? So, in this case, what this is saying is the body, everything in the body gets this rule. What rule is it? The background, I'm setting to pound sign FFFFF, which if you remember is white. All right. The color designates the color of the text, and that's going to be this color, which 
Again, we know because we just looked at it a minute ago, but even if we didn't look at it a minute ago, we'd know that this is some shade of green. All right? How would we know it's some shade of green? Because the two characters that represent the green is higher than anything else. All right? Here's the two characters for red, 3F. 5, 1 is greater than 3F. It's just like regular numbers. You know that 80 is bigger than 30. Why? Because 8 is bigger than 3. You look at the highest digit to see if what, what number is bigger. So 5 is bigger than 3. So I know that there's more green in it than red. And there's absolutely no blue at all in this. So if we remember that red plus green gives us yellow, we can come to the conclusion that this is going to be a yellowy sort of green. All right. Now the good news is, is that if you don't know this, remember those tools help you by giving it to you, giving you the, the color codes. All right. We also know that this is a shade of green. This is a different style rule. This rule applies to H1s. All right. Now remember, H1s are still in the body. So things can get their style from a combination of, of style rules. And what takes precedence is the more specific you define the style rule, that takes preference over a less specific style rule. So for example, what I define for H1, you know, there's two background colors for H1s. There's the one that I define for the H1 and there's one that I define for the body. Well, the H1 style rule is more specific, right? It's specifically for H1, so that's the one that's going to take precedence over this. Likewise, color is going to take precedence over that. Were I to remove this, all right, and save it, then... the H1 gets the same color as the rest of the text in the body, right? Because we didn't define a specific color for body, so there's nothing to take precedence for that. Therefore, the body color is what applies. So this is a cascading part of a cascading style sheet. Think of it as like sort of a waterfall that the styles trickle down. You know, you can define styles on the body, and then the header section, and then the H1s, and then so on. And the closer to the tag that you've defined the style rule, that's what takes precedence over the rest of, uh, of that. All right? So the big advantage of this, again, is it's in both places. Both pages refer to the style rule through the use of this link tag. All right? Link, REL equals style sheet. Type equals text slash CSS. href equals style.css. These two things together tell the browser you're dealing with the style sheet. All right, you're dealing with the style sheet. That's why we don't have to put the style tag in there, right? Because it already knows we're dealing with the style sheet. And this says the name of the file that you are using. All right. How many style sheets do you think you're going to have for one site? Are we going to have one style sheet per page? Probably not. That defeats the purpose of it, right? The whole idea of putting it in a style sheet is so that we can share that style between multiple pages. And we want consistency, right? Are we going to have one style sheet for our entire site? Maybe, but maybe not. All right. As we talk more about style sheets, we'll see how style sheets can be used in a couple different ways. For one thing, you can specify when to use a style sheet as far as displaying it on the screen versus printing something. All right. Let's say I wanted to make a, a print version of this page. All right, I wanted to print it out to the printer. In that case, I might get rid of all the colors and just print it in black and white. Right? 
I might get rid of the images. All right. Um, I might get rid of the ads if this was on a page that had ads or something like that. Right. So I might have a different style sheet for printing versus displaying on the screen. So that's one reason why I might have different style sheets. That's the media, and we'll see the media attribute later on in this course. But just to give you a preview, you might want to print it differently than show it on the screen. Same web page, I just want to look at it. I want a simpler version of print so it doesn't take as much ink up. All right. Another difference could be displaying it on a mobile phone or a mobile device versus a desktop or laptop. All right. Typically speaking, we want a simpler style for a mobile version of a web page than we do for a desktop version. Desktops are big, right? Their monitors are big. Even laptops have big monitors. All right. So for a desktop site, we might have two columns of information side by side. Well, that might make it very hard to read if we were to view that same page on a mobile device. So maybe for a mobile device, we have it such that it's only one column. All right. So you might have more than one style sheet, but you're not having one style sheet per page. In addition, there may be a couple oddball pages on your site that you, for whatever reason, you handle those differently. Maybe a photo gallery page that looks different than the main page. Maybe the home page looks different than the rest of the pages. That's a very common sort of design thing. It's going to look consistent, right? It's not going to look like drastically different, but it's not going to have the same format as the rest of the pages. Let's go to, and I always pick colleges, I think, for this. I don't know why. I think because uh, college websites are pretty predictable. <laughs> All right. There's the home page for CSU. Wow, they're living it up. Look at that. I didn't know homecoming was this weekend. Oh, it's actually, it's actually next week. I commuted to Cleveland State, so homecoming doesn't really <laughs> mean a lot to me. All right. Anyhow, if I go to another one of these pages, like let's say I go to admissions. Whoops. Okay, I'm not liking this. I'm going to try another one. All right, home page looks like this. I go to another page on their site. It has a different look. I go to the calendar. It has a different look. I go to for students. It has a different look. I'm not liking this one either. I mean, I'm liking it in some respects, but it's not proving my point or demonstrating my point. Uh, let's think of a... Someone has to come through for me. Let's look up University of Akron. All right. There is their home page. If I go to admissions... This has a very consistent look. All the pages have sort of the uh, same layout. I hate to do this, but let's go to our page. I'm not saying a word. All right, here's the home page. That has one layout. Pretty much every other page on the site has a different layout. All right? Sort of the main topics have this kind of layout. 
And then the detail page has this different layout. So notice there's three different layouts. And this is consistent across, again, like any website, there's some good things and bad things about it. One good thing I like about, the, uh, about LC's website is that there is sort of three main layouts that the pages have. And pages that serve a different role have a different layout. So these detail pages where the real nitty gritty information is, has this kind of layout. Where there's a navigation on the side, there's some learn more stuff here, and there's the main article in the middle with the navigation. The home page is its own beast. All right, it has its own look. Each of these sort of top level sections all look sort of the same, where they have the main topics like in a menu here. All right, so that page looks a lot like that page, because they're both sort of top level topics. All right, so actually, for the point I was trying to prove, this is, this is, this is what I wanted to, to have, that not necessarily every single page is going to have the same layout. Pages that serve different roles might have a slightly different layout. Yet, there's still consistency. All right? If we look, the color scheme is consistent from page to page. All right? Blue is used a lot, as well as this color. There's only a handful of colors used. We don't have 16 different colors. We have the blue, we have this shade, and we have this shade, and maybe a couple other ones. So even though the pages look different, there is still a level of consistency. Remember, when I say consistent, it doesn't mean identical. All right? It means that things like the font are, is consistent, the colors are consistent, um, the feel is consistent even if the layout is slightly different. All right, so the bottom line is you're not going to have one style sheet per page. You might be able to design a website, if it's simple enough, with only one style sheet. Or you might have a handful of style sheets for a larger site for different reasons. All right, for all the different reasons that I talked about before. In most of our cases, we're going to probably deal with like one style sheet because the examples we're going over are um, simple enough that, that it probably doesn't require, you know, we're doing, even your project is like six or seven or eight pages, right? That's not like a hundred pages where you have different groups of pages. Now, if you looked at the calendar, what week of the semester are we in? We're in week four. All right. <laughs> How many weeks are there in the whole semester? 15 or 16. All right. I, there's, there's 15 plus a finals week, so it depends on how you count it. All right. So let's say there's 16 because that makes the math easier. All right. We are one quarter of the way through the class, if you can believe that. All right. I still have to like, think about where my classes are, yet we're already one quarter of the way through. What does that mean? That means that pretty soon the project is going to become important. Start looking at the design and you think that, well, I still have a lot of time. Well, you do, but it's not too early to start thinking about it. So probably next week we'll start talking about the project. I have to look at my schedule, to, to, I have to look at my notes to review. But I'm pretty sure the next topic that we talk about after we finish up a little bit about style sheets here is going to be the project. So, in the meantime, what you can do is go to Canvas. and read these documents. There should be a module for the project. Semester project. There is there are three documents that you should look at. Project overview, 
the design instructions, and the completed instructions. Now we'll talk about those in class, but it would be good if you previewed those so that um, I can answer any questions you have as I go through and explain it. All right, back to style sheets. Throughout the semester, just as time goes on, we're going to make enhancements to style sheets to do more things. Remember that anything that deals with the way the information is laid out on the page or the way the information looks on the page is controlled by CSS. All right. The content of the page, in other words, the text, the links, the headings, the images, the videos, and so on that you have is part of the HTML. That's the content of it. But the way that it looks, the layout and the appearance of it is defined by CSS. So, really, the first few weeks of this class, everyone's web pages look the same. All right, because all we studied were some basic tags, H1s, H2s, links, lists. If I'm not looking closely, I can't tell one student from another. All right, and again, it got the information across, but for a number of reasons, it's good to change the look of your page. All right, the one thing that I want to communicate, and I think I've communicated this, and I'm going to emphasize this, is you change the look of the page not just to make it look nice. All right? Certainly we want our pages to look good. We don't want people turning away screaming because our pages look so hideous. All right? But that's not the goal. Part of the goal is to help communicate. And again, the appearance of the page communicates several different ways. One way it communicates is it sets the mood. All right? When you go to the Wall Street Journal, that's a very formal looking page. It uses very basic white and black, white uh, background and black text on it for the most part. It uses a very basic, business-like, straightforward font. All right? It looks effectively like a newspaper, which the Wall Street Journal was, or still is. All right. Now compare that to a couple other sites. Apple. When you go to Apple, so let's bring these two up. Remember that there's always two aspects to web development. There's the technical and there's the design. The technical is how to do something. The design is, is figuring out what the best things are to do and figuring out the best way that we can communicate what we want to do using all the different stylistic techniques we know. So let's look at the Wall Street Journal. Oh, I think I'm signing up for a subscription. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. Looks like a newspaper, right? Black and white, nothing really fancy with the fonts. Little splashes of color here and there. All right. Compare that to Apple. Also very professional looking. Also mainly black and white. All right. So this isn't an extreme difference like comparing Barbie's web page with Wall Street Journal. But how would you describe the difference of feel that you get between, say, the Apple page and the Wall Street Journal? What's some observations that you can make between those two? There's a lot less text on the Apple site. What do you think that communicates. Why do you think it was done that way? They have a, they have a different product here. Kind of stuff. Okay. 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 L let me summarize those observations because those are excellent observations. They're both 
quote, selling different uh, uh, products. Wall Street Journal is about information. So maybe that's why their page is more densely packed than the Apple page. Because they want to show you they got a lot of information. All right, so their page is relatively dense. By dense, I mean there's a lot of stuff on a single page. Apple, on the other hand, is selling a product, a physical product that you hold in your hand. And therefore, they don't want, they don't want you distracted by a lot of different stuff. They want you to really focus on it. All right? So is, is that a good summary of what you said? Yeah, I, I, um, so that's a great observation. Any other observations? What is Apple known for? I, and again, that's a loaded question. We could have a lot of fun with that, depending on who's in the audience. But what is Apple known for? Neat and tidy, another way to say it is simple, right? The whole idea, you know, the whole, from the way the cases are designed, and if you read, if you read, um, Steve Jobs' um, biography, you will find how he obsessed over the tiniest details of the products, all right? Only one button on a Mac mouse, right? Why? Because two's too complicated, all right? I'm not saying I agree or disagree with it, but that was the design philosophy, all right? He wanted things to make certain sounds when you like snap the lid of your laptop. He wanted that to sound a certain way, all right? To really give you the idea that yes, that's closing and do it with authority and, and that sort of thing, all right? He didn't want anything like raised on the things. Everything is very sleek and smooth. There's no buttons sticking out, all right? He had to, uh, some of his engineers had to fight with them to get a diskette drive installed in them. Not because, th these are the old Macs years and years ago, not, certainly not now. And why was it because he didn't think diskettes were useful? No, he think that diskettes um, ruined the design of it, aesthetically. All right, so you can debate that whole thing if you wanted to and talk about the good things and the bad things about it. But the point is, is it's clear that Apple wants to portray a certain sort of um, feeling about their products. Simplicity, modernness, sleekness, well-made, well-designed, they want to do that. So therefore, their page sort of mirrors the design of their product as was said, and it does very, very carefully showcases their products. So, very simple font, sans serif, no little wigglies on the end of the letters, all right, needless frill, all right, and the pages are very spacious, all right, very simple. You look at this, you are looking at the MacBook, right? You're not looking at, like the Wall Street Journal, where you see this. What are you looking at? Well, it depends on who you are. For some people, <laughs> if you have money, you might be looking at this article, right? Um, if you're broke and interested in politics, you might be looking at this article, right? You have choices of stuff to look at because, again, their whole, um, their whole reason for existing, what they're selling you is selling you information. Okay, so that's what I mean when I talk about these design things go more than simply making it look nice. It can communicate a feel about an organization in addition to conveying the information. Also, design things help you organize, developing, all right, in red. Only thing in red. So, provided that you can see red, that's going to be 
that's going to stand out to you. All right? The use of the font show the headlines that helps organize the page. You could do all this with simple HTML and have everything the same size font, but then nothing would stand out and it would be difficult to tell where one article began and another article ended and so on. So we're using design to help visually organize the page. All right, let's do a little bit more with CSS than we did originally. Okay, now there's a whole slew of things that we can do in CSS. We're going to do some of them and we're going to see how just by making a couple of tweaks to the CSS, we can take this page that looks pretty boring originally, all right, and we can make it start to look more like a completed web page, all right. So let's look at this page without any CSS. Let me remove the CSS and we'll look at the page, all right. That's how every web page looked like in 1993 or whatever, all right? And that's what all your web pages look like the first week of class. The information's there. Um, at the very least, it's not cluttered. It, it's not particularly appealing, but it isn't ugly, all right? But with a few things, we can make this look better. The first thing we did is we added a little bit of color to this. And we added color, we picked colors that we thought, or I thought, goes with the content. In other words, rabbits, well, nature, all right? So I'm going to make it green, all right? Now one thing that would be useful is, what if we made this, and again, if we look at this, with the screen all the way going across, that's a long way for the eye to travel, all right? It would be nice if we could bring this into a single column but not take up the entire page. We can do that with a different attribute. So the first thing I want you to do whenever you're thinking about, I want to change my web page to be different, all right, is to ask yourself, Am I adding content or, if am, I, or am I adding the, the way that it looks? If I'm adding content, then I want to make changes to the HTML. If I'm simply changing the appearance, I'm going to want to change the CSS. So in this case, right now the site, the page looks like this. Everything goes all the way across the page. Well, just by tweaking it a little bit and making it so that there's a little bit of margin here, we could probably make the page look a lot better. All right? So let's do that. How do we do that? Well, there's a lot of attributes in CSS, and I don't expect you to memorize all of them. But you'll remember the ones that you use a lot. All right. The W3 Schools has a CSS reference and has a list of all the different things that you can do with CSS. And we'll continually revisit this page to see some of the things we can do. All right. First thing I want to do is I want to make the header, the nav, the article, and the footer not go all the way across the page. These are block tags. By default, they go all the way across the page. So what I'm going to do in my CSS is I'm going to say with 600 pixels. And I'm going to say that for the header, the nav, the 
article and the footer. Now what's 600 pixels? What's a pixel? A pixel is a, a dot on the screen. All right. This is, if you look real close to your screen, you'll notice that your screen is a series of tiny little dots that change colors. There's about a thousand or so dots going from side to side. All right. So it, uh, for this particular monitor, that is. So if I say 600 pixels, that's roughly 60% of it. So it's not going to go all the way across. It's going to go like maybe this far. Why do I have header twice? Oh, because I had copied and pasted and I forgot to get down to change it. All right. Now I save this and I go and look at this and again, doesn't go all the way across the page. All right. And the nice thing is, is because both those pages use the same file, whoops, neither does this page. This one doesn't cross the whole page either. All right. Now I can go in and make other changes. Maybe H1s I want to make bigger. So I can say font dash size 2M. Make it twice as big as it normally is. How did I know that? Well again, I've done a lot of fonts before. If you haven't done a lot of fonts before, you could look up in the CSS tutorial and look up how you can change things about the fonts. There's a font family we can change, font size, and so on down the line. Here's a particular thing that I did. So now when we do this, You'll notice that those headers are really big. Let's make them bigger still. On occasion, I will make things really stand out by making them really big. And let's make the color of this white. I can either use the word white or I can use the apps. All right. Now, one thing that I might want to do, and this is the last thing we'll do today, is I want to center it. Very simple way to center things is to say this, and we'll come back to what this means later on. Essentially what we're going to do is we're going to give, we're telling it to set the margins automatically. So that, the end result of that will be that the page is centered. So again, I'm not pretending that this is a great looking web page. But with a few little tweaks, we've gone from looking just very, very basic and straightforward to starting to move in a direction where this looks like a completed web page. All right. And then there's other things that we could do as well. All right, based on this. Questions about this? Yeah. I'm going to just neaten up the code. Remember, the browser doesn't care how neat the code is, but sometimes it's useful for you to have the code laid out in a way. So instead of just being one string of things, we can see each attribute on its own line. Sometimes that makes it easier to read. Next week, what we're going to do is we're going to have more fun with style sheets.
All right, we're going to do a few more things. We're not going to do everything because number one, even throughout the whole semester, we're not going to do everything with CSS. All right, there's just too much stuff to do. But we are going to do a few more things with CSS just to give you a sense of the things that you can do with CSS. Once you have an idea about that, then it's easier for you to go and investigate on your own and do the stuff that you want to do. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to review the requirements for the project. So that'll be the two things that we will do next week. Questions about any of this? All right, we'll see you up in lab.